materials and lighting help our models look their best. Materials are made up of shaders, which tell the render engine how services should interact with light, what color they should be, how reflective or diffuse those surfaces should look. Let's start simple. Our default cube already has a material applied to it. It's not very exciting, but it's there and we can see some of its properties by selecting the cube, then in our properties editor, select the material properties tab. That's this icon here that looks like a checkered sphere. We can see the hierarchy of the data in our outliner by unhiding the mesh data and then the material data under our cube object. I'll do this so we can see the changes reflected as we go. The material properties show us a window with a material slot. It is currently labeled material, but we can rename this by clicking on the name and entering a new one. I'll call this blue mat. Notice how in the outliner, our material name is also updated. We can unhide the preview panel here. Currently, it is showing us what the material would look like if it was applied to a sphere. But we can see what this material might look like on a flat surface, particles, cloth, or even a fluid. If you want to see a more complex model, let's choose the shader ball. This one will capture better approximations of shadowed areas and reflections. The next panel down is our surface, and there appears to be a few settings here. If we click on the button next to surface over here, we get a pop out showing us a list of shaders that we can choose from. The principled BSDF is the default material because it's a great all round useful shader with controls for a range of properties that most materials will need. Let's switch to something more basic. I'm going to pick a diffuse shader. Let's click on the color swatch and change this to something like a nice blue using this color wheel. And just because we can, we'll reduce the roughness. The preview shows the changes, but our viewport does not. Well, yet. This is because we're still in solid shading mode. It is currently set to studio lighting. And even though we have some options to preview in various ways, they won't reflect the shaders that we have applied to this material. So we'll switch to material preview mode in our viewport. I'm going to use the hotkey for this, Z, and select material from the pop-up radial menu. Now our cube will show the material preview that matches the preview in the material editor. Going to add a couple more objects now. I'll add a plane to simulate some ground, and I'll move this cube up so it sits on it. And let's add a sphere. I'll set the shading of the sphere to smooth and place it here next to the cube. The new objects haven't had any materials assigned to them. Select the plane, shift select the sphere, and then the cube. I can hit Control L to bring up my linking menu and select Link Materials. All the selected objects will inherit the material of the active object. Let's select the sphere and go to its material settings. I'm going to duplicate this material and change its name. I'm going to call this Red Gloss. I'll click on the button that says Diffuse next to Surface and select the shader which will be more reflective. Glossy happens to be a good one. Our options change, but the color and the roughness remain the same because any attributes that shaders share will be copied over. I'll change its color to something more reddish. The surface now appears highly reflective. However, you might notice something is a little off about these reflections. How come we can see some sky and trees, but not this plane or the cube reflected in its surface? And we should, they're fairly close. In the material preview mode, we're using the EV render engine. By default, it doesn't have the ray tracing capabilities enabled. But if we go to our render properties, we can see that under the EV settings, there's a tick box next to ray tracing. If we tick that, 
we should see the plane and cube reflected in its surface also. The default settings are good enough, so we don't need to go deeper into this topic, but you do need to know where this other reflection is coming from. Let's go to the Render Preview dropdown. Under Lighting, there are two tick boxes for Scene Lighting and Scene World. The tick boxes allow us to include any in scene lighting and world settings in our viewport rendering. And there's a panel with a reflective sphere. This is showing us the environment texture that is being used to light our objects. If we increase the world opacity, we'll see it appear in our viewport. If we orbit around our view, it appears as though this texture is mapped to the inside of a giant sphere. Let's switch this to a studio setup and rotate it. The shadows on our objects will move as if there are actual studio lights being rotated around the scene. Now that we know where the light is coming from, we can reduce the opacity of this texture once more so we don't get distracted by it in the viewport. Now, the tick box for in scene lighting is still switched off which means that even though we have this lamp object here, it's not actually contributing to how the materials are responding to their environment. To lessen the confusion, I'm going to delete the lamp altogether. We'll talk more about lighting in the next lesson. Now let's create a second material for this cube and assign it to a specific face. Next to this area, there's a plus and minus sign. I'll hit the plus sign, and we'll see a new slot appear. I'll select the slot, then click on New. And this time I'll choose a different shader. Let's have a little fun. I'm going to choose an emission shader and call it Yellow Glow. I'll change its color to a yellow and increase its strength. It hasn't appeared anywhere on the cube yet because all the faces still have the blue mat assigned to them. I need to toggle into Edit Mode, go into Face Select Mode, and select this face here. Now I can select my yellow glow material and click Assign. I'll toggle back into Object Mode, and now this cube has one face which has this material on it. An emission acts much like a light source. Because we've enabled ray tracing and because this is a material, the glow will affect the surfaces of other objects. The plane still has our diffuse blue material. And you can see how the glow is showing up slightly here. And in the reflective sphere, the glow is very bright. So now let's take a look at Blender's Shader Node Editor. I'm going to switch my workspace to Shading. And we should see our 3D viewport change slightly. We can once again see the background image that is creating our lighting, as well as two spheres down here. These are our HDRI preview spheres and they give us an indication of what a standard diffuse and reflective surface would look like in the chosen environment. We can hide these if they're too confusing. Just go to our viewport overlays and untick HDRI preview. With our cube selected, let's view our material properties editor and select the blue matte material. The editor below the 3D viewport here is our shader editor. There are two nodes here. One is named Diffuse BSDF and is connected to this material output node. We can see some of the settings reflected in this node, the color and roughness. A node generally has inputs and outputs, which means information can be connected and mixed as we build a node tree. I'll select our plane here. It still has the blue matte material assigned to it. I'll make a copy by clicking on the two here and call this Floor. The top left window is a file browser. I can navigate to where I saved a texture and when I see the one I want, I'm gonna drag and drop it into my image editor here. Now it may not be enabled by default, but there's a really useful add-on called Node Wrangler. I'm going to go check my preferences and under Add-ons, search for Node Wrangler. There it is, mine happens to be disabled, so I'll enable it and shut down my preferences. Now, if I hover my mouse over the shader editor, 
and hit the N key, I'll reveal my side panel, and the lowest tab is labeled Node Wrangler. Here, you can see a number of functions to help you work with nodes, but the one we're looking for is Add Texture Setup. The shortcut is Control T. I'll select my Diffuse Shader node, hit Control T, and a bunch of new nodes are added and connected to the color input of the Diffuse Shader node. One of these is a texture input. Because we've already loaded our wood texture into Blender's memory, we can select this from this drop down here. And as soon as we do, this wood image is mapped to our plane. Let's take a look at these new nodes in a bit more detail. We have a texture coordinate node. This has a range of options for mapping. We can see that the UV output is connected to our mapping vector node. So it is using the UV coordinates of the plane. Our mapping node gives us some controls for where the image is located, how it is rotated and scaled. And finally, our texture node holds the image. The color output of this image is going into the color slot of the diffuse texture, overriding the blue color. Finally, the BSDF output from this node goes into the surface input of the material output node. This collects the sum total of all the nodes linked and outputs our final result onto the surface, which holds the material. But what if we wanted some of that color on this wooden floor? We can't get it back from the diffuse shader, but we can introduce some color and mix it in. I'll add a new node, a color mix node. I'll drop it on this line between the texture and the diffuse shader, and it should create an automatic connection. The color output of the texture should be attached to the mix node's A input and the result should connect to the color input of the diffuse shader. B still has a swatch available, and we can click on this and choose any color we like. Notice the plane's material change in real time. Currently, the operation for adding color is set here to mix, and the factor slider is mixing the original texture and the color equally. We can slide this between zero and one. Zero meaning that only the A input is visible, and one meaning that only the B is visible. So having it somewhere between, we can mix these together. We can change the operation by which the color affects the texture. I'm going to choose multiply. And I can now tint this floor so it looks more like a polish. But this image has a bit of the original color, and this is messing with my end result. So I think I want to convert this image to a black and white one first. There's a node for this too. I'll drop in an RGB to black and white node here, and I'll change my operation to color, as the color will only affect the higher values of this image. Okay, this is nice, but now I want to add a bit of reflection to our floor. Now I could replace this diffuse texture altogether, or I could add a gloss shader node and mix in just a little gloss to our tree. I'll do this by adding a mix shader node as well and dropping it between the diffuse shader and the material output. Then I'll connect the output of the glossy node to the second shader slot. Currently the factor is mixing both shaders equally. These gaps in the panels here they shouldn't really be reflective. And no matter how I tweak the factor, we're not going to get a great result. So instead, I can plug in the value from our black and white converted texture to tell the mix that only the higher values should be glossy. Materials and textures are a huge topic. And if you want to dive in further, I would highly recommend the core fundamentals courses on these topics. But already what we've covered in just this lesson should give you enough grounding to create your own materials and textures. And when you're comfortable with that, let's move on to the next lesson. <music>